Amen. Well, imagine with me for a moment that you are uh, watching television or listening to the radio or you're scrolling through Facebook or Instagram and one of whatever news media that you prefer rolls up. And this might be a headline that you hear. Imagine that you're listening to the news and you hear this headline. Politician receiving funds from a foreign nation in order to spy on American political system. Or maybe you heard this one. Dictator invades other country, threatens nuclear war, and kills those who dissent and disagree with him. Or maybe you'll see this headline. Pastor found to be hiding an affair in a second family, using church resources to fund his lifestyle. Or leaders of this non-for-profit organization or educational institute using funds to uh, protect groomers and those who sexually assault minors. These headlines are ripped right from our world. Those are actual headlines that have been in, our, uh, in the rotation in the last year. But these headlines, although they are very contemporary, just within the last year we have heard these headlines, they might as well have been written about the nation of Israel more than 2,000 years ago, 2,600 years ago, actually. And that's what we see in the scriptures, in the Old Testament, in a book called Jeremiah. It's about a prophet of God named Jeremiah and the word that God gave to him. So I'm going to invite you to grab the, the Bible that's in the seat back in front of you. We're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 8. I believe that the page number is 547, 549, something like that. We'll be in Jeremiah chapter 8. We're going to hear about some of the headlines and the responses that happened at this time, in the time of Jeremiah, 600 years before Jesus was born. We're going to begin in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 4, and it says this. This is the Lord speaking. You shall say to them, thus says the Lord, when people fall, do they not get back up again? If they go astray, do they not turn back? Why then has this people turned away in perpetual backsliding? They have held fast to deceit. They have refused to return. I have given heed and listened, but they do not speak honestly. No one repents of wickedness, saying, what have I done? All of them turn to their own course, like a horse plunging headlong into battle. Even the stork in the heavens knows its time, and the turtle dove, the swallow, and the crane observe the time of their coming. But my people do not know the ordinance of the Lord. How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us, when in fact the false pin of the scribes has made it into a lie? The wise shall be put to shame. They shall be dismayed and taken, since they have rejected the word of the Lord. What wisdom is in them? Therefore I will give their wives to others and their fields to conquerors, because from the least to the greatest, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. From prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. They have treated the wound of my people carelessly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. They acted shamefully. They committed abomination, and yet they were not at all ashamed. They did not know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time when I punish them, they shall be overthrown, says the Lord. And we jump down to verse 18 now, and we hear Jeremiah's response. This is Jeremiah now speaking back to God. My joy is gone. My grief is upon me. My heart is sick. Hark the cry of my poor people from far and wide in the land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their images, with their foreign idols? The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. For the hurt of my poor people, I am hurt. I mourn and dismay has taken a hold of me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And after we get done reading scripture, we say, this is the word of the Lord. We all together say, thanks be to God. And it's hard to say, thanks be to God, after a passage like this. Pretty dark, pretty depressing, pretty sad. To give a little bit of context, Jeremiah lived 600 years before Jesus was born. And at this point in the history of the people of Israel, uh, they had been split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was called the kingdom of Israel. The southern kingdom was called the kingdom of Judah. By this point in the story, the kingdom of Israel had already been overthrown by the Assyrians, 
And now the kingdom of Israel was no longer Israel. It was under the king of Assyria. And there were some Jews living in Israel at the time. But now all that was left of the Lord's nation was the southern kingdom of Judah with the capital in Jerusalem. This was kind of the hub, the main area of God's people. And Jeremiah was a Jew, of course, and he was living in Jerusalem. And this is the word that he hears. In fact, uh, this part of the prophecy of Jeremiah, as he's giving this prophecy, he's in the temple courts, in the temple, the place of worship. And he's preaching this long sermon here at the beginning of Jeremiah. And this deeply sad and depressing uh, word from God outlines the evil that was going on in the kingdom of Judah. And if we just actually flip back one page and look at Jeremiah 7, we actually see some of the things that Israel was doing, and I'll let you read it on your own later. But in short, the kingdom of Judah, every single person was worshiping idols. And the Lord was very upset about this, specifically because with idols at this time, you would always craft some sort of uh, um, an, a, the physical idol that you would have in your home that you would worship. That was a conduit of, of whatever God that you were praying to, whatever God you were worshiping. And this caused great distress for the Lord, not only because were you worshiping another God, but you were actually using natural resources that God gave to us to harness and to use for the good of others were being carved and were being worked in order to worship false gods. The stone and the wood, these gifts from God were actually used to worship false gods. And we're told in chapter seven that everybody, every man, woman, and child, husbands and wives and their children all worked in order to produce these idols and all worked in order to worship these false gods. The whole family was involved. There was nobody that this didn't touch. And not only that, but they were also obstinate that they had the word of the Lord, they had the, the Torah, the, the law of the Lord, and yet they were still worshiping this false idol. But it only gets worse. Because as we see in the early parts of Jeremiah, the kingdom of Judah was also very brutal to those who were different from them. They mistreated foreigners and immigrants, which in the law of the Lord actually says to bring them in and treat them well and make sure they're taken care of. They were abusing these people. They were taking hold of them and forcing them into marriages, and they were mistreating them as slaves. They were being brutal, physically brutal to them, and making them do all kinds of awful atrocities in the name of these other gods. And what's worse in chapter 7 is that the people of Israel actually erected an altar to a false god right outside the temple, right outside the temple of the Lord, where God lived, and they would sacrifice their children to these gods. This was an evil, evil, evil time and evil people. And the Lord God said, I will destroy these people. They will be overthrown. Most of them will die and they will be taken into exile. And that's exactly what happens. Jeremiah predicts all of this um, uh, terrible uh, outcome of all these things that the people of Judah were doing. And sure enough, in just a few years, Babylon was going to come and overthrow the kingdom of Judah and was going to take everybody over to Babylon and they would be exiled away from the Lord and away from their home and away from their temple. The temple would be destroyed, Jerusalem would be razed to the ground, and everything would be destroyed. Jeremiah's response here, as we read in verses 18 through 21, is that it breaks his heart. He is heartbroken not only for the evil that's been going on, but also for the outcome of his people. He was brokenhearted because of the injustice that he saw, but also because it was his friends and his family and his neighbors that were going to die, that were going to be overthrown. And Jeremiah prays for deliverance. He prays for deliverance, that the Lord might rescue them from this. But ultimately, he comes to this conclusion. For the hurt of my people, I am hurt. I mourn, and dismay has taken a hold of me. He feels deeply uh, this injustice, and he feels deeply this outcome that's inevitable to his people. Now, for most of us, we are not like Jeremiah, 
where we don't have a front row seat to these kinds of atrocities. And if we're being honest, most of our conversations with God, most of our prayers, the interaction that we have with God, uh, usually ends up sounding something like this. Lord, bless this food. Lord, keep me safe. The Lord, keep my child safe from bullies or from that friend who's kind of mean to me. Lord, help me get this job. Or Lord, take this job away from me. Or Lord, help me win the lottery. Or Lord, give me health. Or Lord, keep my loved one healthy. Or keep my loved one alive. Most of our prayers end up sounding a lot like comfort for us. And these prayers are good. These are good prayers to pray. We ought to be asking God for these kinds of things. Maybe not for the lottery. You don't need to win the lottery. Just be smarter with your money. But these are good prayers to pray to God. They're all normal prayers that you and I are going to pray throughout our lives. But if this is all that we're doing when we pray, if this is all that we're praying for, then we're missing out. We're missing out on all that God has for us. And we're missing out on what it means to be truly human. Because the Lord Jesus Christ, he put on flesh, fully God, fully man, walked the earth. He showed us what it means to be fully human, to live a good and full and abundant life. What we say here is we say a transformed life, a transformed kind of life in Jesus' name. He was totally, and he was the penultimate human. And yet, when he was entering Jerusalem before his death, he wept over Jerusalem, and he prayed a prayer that sounds a lot like Jeremiah. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. If only you knew what was coming. Jesus felt the depth of pain and the depth of injustice and suffering. And he mourned for others. He had empathy with others. And if our prayers, if we're just praying and we're kind of like glossing over everything and just praying for comfort, we're missing out on a key aspect of what prayer is. And we don't, under, don't fully understand what prayer is or how it works. You see, most of us think uh, that prayer is us twisting God's arm to give us something. We say, Lord, we, I really could use this, uh, whatever it might be. I could use this new job, or I could, you know, Lord, my child's being difficult about X, Y, and Z. They're having a hard time with this subject. Or, or, Lord, I really need to figure out this problem that I'm having with this coworker. And we seek the Lord, and we're just kind of like, we feel like we're just twisting God's arm. Lord, just, if you could, please just do this for me. We kind of bargain with him. Lord, I'm a good person. I try really hard. I, I'm, I'm pretty good. I, I don't get everything right. But, Lord, if you could just do this for me, please. I, I've prayed those prayers before. Lord, if only you would do this, I would do this for you. We think that we're trying to convince God of something. We're trying to change God. We're trying to change his mind or change his behavior. and We're twisting his arm in order to try to get something that we want. But the reality of it is that when we pray, it is not God who is changed. God doesn't change his mind. God doesn't change his heart when he prays. It's actually us who are changed. It's us who are renewed. And it's us who change when we pray. When we pray, heaven and earth overlap, and our desires and our hopes and our dreams are changed to align with God's hopes and God's desires and God's plans and his dreams and his work. And so when we pray, it is not so much us trying to get God to do something, but it's us aligning ourselves with God and what he's doing. Jesus himself even did this. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before he was going to be crucified, he knew what was coming. He knew he was going to be tortured. And he prayed to the Lord three separate times, Lord, if you could please let this cup pass, which simply means let this not happen. Let me not have to be tortured and killed. He said, Lord, if I don't have to go through this, please don't make me go through this. If it can pass, let it pass. And then he prays, but not my will, but your will. Even in that moment, Jesus, fully God and fully man, was feeling the burden and the grief of being confronted with his own death and his own torture, the pain and the suffering he had to go through. And he even prayed for God to take it away from him. But ultimately, Jesus knew it's not about us, but it's about God. And we are the ones who get aligned with God. And so I want to encourage you to add this kind of prayer into your life, to pray for a broken heart. Because when we pray for a broken heart, we are brought closer to God. We are aligned with God because God hates injustice. God hates suffering. God hates abuse. He hates these things. They are not meant to be part of his world. He never meant for it to happen. But God is a parent. 
and he has a broken heart because he's watching his children harm themselves. He's watching his children as they lead this life that unfolds where they suffer and they cause other sufferings. He is, a, the, he is the broken heart of a parent who is giving over control to his kids to live their own life and he's watching them be hurt and he's watching them suffer. God mourns when we mourn and he does not delight when bad things happen. And so when we pray for a broken heart, when we pray, God, break my heart, we are brought closer to God and we are actually brought into alignment with God. And in this prayer, Lord, break my heart for the injustice that I see. God gives us his heart. He gives us his hopes, his desires, and his dreams. And we are the ones who are changed. And he gives us, most importantly, hope. Hope that it will not always be this way. Because God has a grand plan to end all suffering. In the last day when Jesus returns, he's going to recreate the earth and everyone will be resurrected and we will be given an eternal life on earth, on the new creation with God, fully, well, it's going to be a full overlap of heaven and earth where God will be there and we will be there and there will be no suffering. There will be no tears. And when we pray, God, break my heart, he gives us hope and longing for that eventual day that will happen. But not only that, he also gives us the power to join him in his work at creating new creation even now. When we pray, break my heart, we are broken out of our own self-centered pursuits. We are broken out of our own interior life where we just think that oh, I need this thing and that thing, I'm worried about this thing that's going on in my car about this and this other thing, and we're burdened, we're grieved, and we become angry for the sake of others. We learn to set down our own anxieties and our own bitterness, and we get to see things from other people's perspective. And then God invites us to step in and begin to work to alleviate, in the small ways that we can, this suffering, this pain that we see around us. We're given the opportunity to work with God as he delivers our world from pain and suffering and moves us toward his desired future of good for us and for others. You see, when we pray, break my heart, God aligns us with him and he gives us hope. Hope for a new kind of future. Hope for a new, kind, a new way of being human. And then he gives us the power by the Holy Spirit to work toward that. And in the midst of all of that, we actually do have comfort. He gives us comfort. And yes, we still have to face the pain. But in the midst of it, we know that we're not suffering alone. And we know that those that we love, that we see suffering, we know that they're not alone either because we're there with them and he's there with them and he is suffering alongside of them. And so we pray, Lord, break my heart, crush it, destroy it. Help me feel deeply for those who are suffering because as Christians, we ought to be the ones who don't avoid pain, but rather feel it the most deeply. We ought to be the ones who are most deeply grieved by the injustice that we see around us and in our world. And our prayers and, and the work of the Holy Spirit does not free us from difficulty, but it gives us hope to continue on, even when it seems hopeless. And unfortunately, sometimes we're going to be like Jeremiah, where Jeremiah prayed this prayer, he prayed for deliverance, and the Lord said, no, the injustice is too great. The sins of my people are too great. And God knew that the Babylonians were going to come in. They were going to destroy Judah and Jerusalem, that his people were going to be taken into exile and to slavery. And there was nothing that Jeremiah could do. The Lord said no to him, did not answer his prayers. But Jeremiah got to feel deeply what the Lord feels. He got to experience just for a little bit the world from the Lord's perspective, a desire and a hope to alleviate the hurt of others. And so when we pray, break my heart, our capacity for love and for goodness, for empathy and for justice all grow. And we get to know deeply the heart and mind of God, and he gets to know us. And when we get to suffer, when we do suffer, we know that the Lord is suffering with us that he is with us, that he is good, 
and that we can uh, help others also suffer well. Not in a hopeless way, but in a way that is filled with hope looking toward the new creation, the day of peace that God has appointed to alleviate all suffering.